through something, and of course I had worked on this Reformation game, so I said, okay, well, we, the first thing we have to do is figure out what we're doing. We've got to get some background reading. We have to start identifying people that can be in the game. And so let's dig into the library, and, and away we go. And that was the first most dangerous step for me um, because while I knew some things about modern Europe, I had a minor field in my PhD program in modern Europe, and I had taught things about modern Europe in, in, in a lot of different ways. I had never really had dug into life in France during World War II. Um, so my cheerful ignorance turned out to get me into some trouble. Um, but the students and I said, okay, well, we'll make this work. Well, it didn't take us long to discover that the historiography, that's fancy historian talk for the things that have been published and are being published and where the, tr where the theories are and so forth, we discovered that that was an interesting story all by itself. So I'm going to keep that brief. Um, the picture you see here is a picture of uh, in Paris when it was being liberated in August of 1944. Um, some of you are thinking, wait a minute, I thought D-Day was June 6, 1944. It was. It took more than two months for the Allies to get to Paris and free it. And it's not that far from the Normandy beaches. So there was a lot of tough fighting in there. But this is the celebration of that. And you can see armored vehicles coming through the Arc de Triomphe. And you can see just on the right a sign that says Viva de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle, that's referring to. Charles de Gaulle was the putative leader of the, what he called the Free French, that is, when the government of France collapsed in June of 1940, he skedaddled. Uh, he went to London, um, good choice, I guess, um, with some of his supporters, and he convinced a somewhat grudging British government to allow him to say that he was representing the real people of France and so forth, and that's a whole long story, but when Paris was liberated. He came in and his supporters, and that's some of them with these vehicles. They had a small army by that time um, that was helping the Allies. And, uh, and de Gaulle wanted to make sure that there would be as much unity as possible for the new government, which he actually became the head of for a little more than a year. And then he came back in power later. That's another story. Um, and so the the earliest scholarship on what happened in France during World War II was somewhat shaped by the mythology that de Gaulle promoted, which was true Frenchmen all resisted the Germans and fought back, and eventually they triumphed and so forth. And that was largely baloney. Um, but also, there were just, um, it was hard for people to get a hold of sources. A lot of things had been destroyed. Um, but not everything. And so um, scholarship starting in the late 1960s, uh, actually with an American historian, I had to throw that in for Dr. Smith, um, and then several others um, began to destroy these myths, um, partly because uh, one of them, one of the key figures, the American historian, also got access to um, German archives from the time of the war in France, the, the German efforts in France that had been captured late in the war. And so there was information in there that earlier scholars hadn't really looked at. Um, and it turned out that the story that de Gaulle had been peddling uh, just wasn't very accurate. It turned out there were a lot of Frenchmen who on their own carried out government activities that you and I would find reprehensible. Uh, and de Gaulle had been saying, well, you know, it was the Germans. You know, they forced the French to do these things. They didn't really want to do it. Um, the archives show that wasn't true. There were plenty of Frenchmen who happily collaborated with their Nazi conquerors. Um, and uh, that began to shake things up. Um, and it continued to, and then uh, over time, in the next uh, few decades, uh, more French and then British archives began to declassify materials as you got a certain number of years, usually 40, 50, 60, past the war. And this accelerated the process of what people were learning to the extent that actually the, the study and the publishing and the research in what happened in France during World War II continues to grow. It's still growing significantly. Um, in fact, I have an interlibrary loan book in my office that I got that I learned about 
in December that was just published late last year uh, about a key trial that happened at the end of the, of the war of, a, of the leader of the government. And it's using new materials and so forth. And it's late March and now April, and I have had hardly any time to even look at it, but I stupidly ordered it on your library loan anyway. So it's not due till April 18th, and maybe Noel will let me keep it longer. Right, Noel? Um, sure, okay. Um, so anyway, what the students and I discovered was that there was a lot of recent publication and literature happening in the field, and I found this exciting because I didn't expect it. I thought we'd be dealing with stuff that was written in the 40s and 50s and 60s maybe, and then it would have kind of just leveled out. Instead, what I found was that it had become a field that a lot of really good scholars are working in and continuing to work in, um, and there are just all kinds of things. And it's also spilling over into people uh, doing work for the popular audiences. Um, and there's a good bit of that. I was just talking to Aaron Baker before class, a biography of one of the, one of the ones I haven't read yet. Um, that is actually one of the characters I have in the game. And I won't mention that person's name because I have students here who are starting this game on Thursday. And uh, I'm, I'm going to try to not let them get any secrets. But anyway, I found this really interesting. Okay, so one of the things I want to do is help you understand what you do when you decide to develop a, a role-playing game because it's not that easy, really. Um, one of the things you have to do is you have to, you have to provide for students. You have a game book, right? Uh, Reagan hasn't looked at it yet, but we do have it. Um, <clears throat> well, okay, you missed Thursday and today, Reagan, so you deserved it. Um, he'll be here. You'll be there Thursday? Yeah, that's good because the game starts Thursday. Uh, you should. Um, but anyway, every, every reacting game has a section that's a historical background. It provides students uh, uh, both a chronology and then a narrative history of the time and what's going on. And the historical background for uh, France before it collapsed, the government collapsed, and France uh, surrendered to the Germans in 1940 is definitely complicated. Um, all kinds of political divisions, serious economic divisions and issues, a lot of social tensions. Um, crazy foreign policy, confused military policy, uh, some other things that I'll mention as we go along. Um, it was not a pretty picture. Um, and so it helps to understand why France collapsed so quickly. The same country that was one of the victors in World War I just melted down um, in 1940. We also had to figure out a game structure. And one of the big questions for game designers is, how long do I want my game to be? Uh, because reacting people do games as short as two class sessions, as long as six. Um, we settled on uh, five game sessions. We decided we're going to start the game in 1940, and we're going we're to have each session be a year apart. So 1940, 41, 42, 43, and ended in 1944. More on that later. We thought we were going to end it with D-Day. Um, that ended up changing. We also had to desi decide... How do you win the game? What are victory objectives? And how do you create the game mechanic structure so that victory is achievable? Um, there's no sense in playing a game if you can't win, right? Yeah, we, there's uh, college students, and the research shows this and, and why the pedagogy works so well, is that college students are inherently competitive. Um, anybody who knows anything about Huntington University knows that from Olympiad. Right? Where students abandon all of their work for a week and compete vigorously for honor and glory and nothing else. Um, so at least I give a few bonus points. Um, so we had to figure out how to make a game that's both playable and understandable but also has victory objectives. Uh, and, so then, and then we also had to have game characters, which means more historical research. You have to find people, and in this case, there's a lot of people. So we wanted real people, and we wanted at least 30. I mean, this is another um, sort of a, a choice because you want people who teach larger classes, like I do. I knew I wanted to try it using this game, so I said I have to have at least 30 roll sheets. And I always want a few extra, especially because in this game, sometimes people die. So <clears throat> characters die, no students. Um, although there are some. Oh, no. sorry, Reagan, I won't pick on you again. Okay. <clears throat> Well, as we started to do that, we ran into obstacles. Um, 
Um, so first, the big question is how do you win or lose? Now, we have a clear source of tension, right? You have the people who are collaborating with the Germans. You have the people who are determined not to collaborate. They're going to fight back. But you also have, and it turns out the research keeps reinforcing this, there were a lot of French people who didn't really want to side with either one. They just wanted to make it through, which is really understandable uh, when you think about it. And in fact, the first time I did actually use the game, I asked students what they would have done you know, if they were really in the situation, and a lot of them said, well, I'm ashamed to say this, but I would have just tried to survive. Um, and I was like, okay, it, that reinforces what we know actually happened. Um, and so, and the other thing that's key in designing these role-playing games is it's not a simulation. It's not, you're not just repeating what actually happened. And, and the reason for that is that, and I tell students this all the time, they can probably quote it with me just about at this point, just because things happen in a certain way doesn't mean they had to happen that way. Uh, historical situations work out the way they do because of the choices that people make. And sometimes they make stupid choices. And sometimes they make choices under pressure and they just don't understand, you know, what, looking back, I'm not really sure why I did that. So in, in these role playing games, one of the things we emphasize is that students have freedom, they have agency to make choices on behalf of their character as long as it's within what they're reacting designers call the corridor of historical plausibility, right? They can't do something that they never would have done, like students trying to give women the vote in ancient Athens. That just doesn't happen. Um, some of you have tried it. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so, so how can we uh, resolve conflict and work through all this without just doing a simulation? Um, and then we, in, in doing that, we ran into what I'm calling the D-Day problem. And that problem is simply everybody, pretty much everybody knows that D-Day happened on June 6, 1944 and the Allies prevailed. So the question is how do, we, how do we build the game to get there without people just saying, well, I already know what happened, so I'm just gonna make my choices so it will align with what, what actually happened, uh, especially because you know, it's, it's hard to get people to accept that that invasion could have failed, right? I mean, nobody wants to be cheering for the Nazis. Well, I hope not, anyway. Um, and so, and then we had, we said, okay, there are also different views of how people in France ought to behave, and there were clear political factions, somewhat complicated. I'll show you a, a video of that. And then there's also the issue of violence. Um, now, students, like to role play violence. Um, I had a student show up today with a, uh, because his character grew up as a fencing champion, showed up with a sword, a fake sword, but nonetheless, a, a sword. I'm like, okay, I asked if anybody was carrying guns and they all claimed they weren't. So, um, but there was violence, right? There were people who sought to assassinate, sometimes successfully. Um, German officers or French government officials. Um, you know, they rolled bombs into cafes, they threw grenades, they did, they did crazy stuff. People blew up railroad bridges and sabotaged this and that and the other thing. So how do you bring the violence in without it getting out of control was something we faced. Uh, and then the most difficult thing, and we knew we needed it, how do you bring anti-Semitism into the game? Uh, and this is one of the things reacting people talk about this all the time. How do you get students to play roles that the characters have reprehensible, awful ideas and beliefs? But it was a real thing. Uh, one of the things that was a big problem in France for decades, not just in 1940, was anti-Semitism. It was alive and well, and in fact, it reared its ugly head a lot in the 1930s, in the decade before the war, um, to the point where there were a group of, uh, how do I say this nicely, far-right thugs who dragged a leading socialist uh, political figure who happened to be a Jew from his car in Paris and beat him almost to death. Um, and, and that kind of thing went on. Um, so th this is, this is, this is a, a difficult thing to handle, and it's one of the things I need to do more work on and reading and, you know, sort of got 
a way to work with it, but it means students have to do some really uncomfortable things. So how do you, how do, you do that? How do you have it present without encouraging students to, to go crazy um, or to do things that, you know, just will flip them out? And then also, should we bring German characters in? There's another question that we struggled with, um, and I'm still kind of working on that, um, but the reality was there were German officials in France and the number grew over time and the, and the bureaucracy became more entrenched. They eventually brought in the Gestapo, the German secret police, to deal with insurgents and so forth. Um, so how do you work that uh, into the game as well? And so you can see this is an actual photograph of one of the, the class and I, when we were workshopping the game, we're trying to figure out what to do with this. So I just got started writing on the board. If you can't read that, you can blame me. Um, but you can see there, we, we, we said, okay, maybe there's kind of a spectrum. We have resist over there on the left, and we have collaborators over on the right who are saying, hey, everything's okay. And then where do, where do people fit, and, and how, do they, how do they? And so we're just trying to get all of the pieces up on the board to see if we could figure out what to do with them. And then this is another example, another workshop class a little later. We've moved now into 1942, and we're like, okay, so now the game has changed, because if you know your World War II basic history, you know by 1942, both the Soviet Union and the United States are in the war. They weren't in June of 1941, while the Soviets were after June 22nd, uh, when the Germans invaded. Um, and the U.S. came in, of course, after Pearl Harbor. Um, so how does that change things in France? How does it change for the people? Um, what does it mean to French people that now the British Royal Air Force is, is stepping up its bombing runs over France to destroy targets that were important to the German war machine? Um, factories and so on and so forth. It wasn't just Germany that got bombed during World War II. So we're trying to deal with that and we're, so we've got all these things and we're, I had, I tried this too and it ended up not working very well. We thought, well, we'll have a faction of people who are moral resistors, people who don't want to take up weapons, they don't want to roll grenades, they don't, but they want to help somehow while remaining uh, out of the actual violence and the fighting. They want to smuggle Jews to freedom, for example, that kind of thing. Now, how do we work them into the game? And then you can see one of the things students love in all caps there in the uh, sort of the middle, a little bit to the right, spies, because there were lots of spies. Um, there were people spying for the Germans, uh, the British were training spies and sending them in, uh, there were French people who, who agreed to work with spy networks, there were all kinds of things going on. So uh, how do you work all those things in? It's a lot to manage and try to get into a game. Well, we said, okay, we're going to push forward, we had to finish by the end of the semester. So we got a prototype done, uh, we got our... Um, our historical background pieces, I assigned each of the students to write a different, uh, with a different focus, their own piece, and, and uh, turn that into me, and I tried to integrate it, and it wasn't really very well integrated, it just ran out of time uh, by the end of the semester. Um, we had some factions and some role sheets. The students, I also assigned different ones to do different characters. I still have this worksheet that shows who's supposed to be writing role sheets for each one. I took a turn to, uh, I did several. So they were rough, but they were ready to at least try out. Um, and then we had, we had come up with an end of the game scenario and we created a die roll table. Now I need to explain this for those of you who haven't been in one of these games. Die rolls are used often in reacting games to, to reach the final conclusion about what happened and how things turned out. And students hate them unless they win, then they love them. But what the die rolls do is reflect the fact that, again, just because things happened in a certain way, they didn't have to. It could have turned out differently, right? We all know this. Military history is the easiest, easiest example. If, if, if a general makes a dumb decision instead of a good one, they might send troops in the wrong direction and boom, they lose. And that's happened plenty of times, um, right? So dire, and, and especially in scenarios where there was doubt about whether you know, for example, D-Day, whether the invasion was going to succeed, um, you know, it's, it's plausible that it would have failed. So anyway, we created, we spent a lot of time working on this and came up with all these things. I'll show that die roll table to you briefly. We don't use it, it, it disappeared. Um, but 
we said, okay, well, we, we have to test this thing. So we met at my house, Natalie might remember this, um, fed some students, they brought some of their friends, the students in the class, and we had enough so we could do a minimal sort of short version of the game. We had a lot of fun and we said, you know what? This isn't bad, it might work. And I said, okay, good, I'm gonna, I'm gonna test this in my Civ classes in the spring of 2020. That'll work in the last part of the semester. There's that die roll table, oops, not too fast. Um, so you can see it's all kinds of work went into this. We did all these odds calculations and die rolls always have modifiers depending on how well students are playing the game. We had this elaborate thing and tried it in the spring of 2020 under difficult circumstances and it still didn't work. So anyway, um, but you know that story, right? I have two, two Civ sections, game test planned for April and the first part of May. Uh, we still had J term then. Um, and then came March, and those of you who were here know exactly what happened. We went virtual, <sighs> teaching an interactive class on Zoom with 30 students and a new game. You remember all of the connectivity issues that people had and the fact that you can't get 30 screen faces on the same Zoom screen, so you got multiple screens, and some people can't put on their video because they don't have enough internet at home, and or in one case, I had a student who was like, yeah, my sister's home from college too, and she's taking classes virtually, and so we just have to kind of work it out. I'm like, oh, great. But of course, what else are you gonna do? I wasn't gonna throw it all out, so I said, we'll try it. Uh, and there were some positive things. Um, enough to know that it could work. I still remember distinctly, I had this one class, it was probably actually my weakest or weaker class that semester, um, but we were in, in the issue of some, some people in their role sheets had government power and they, they decided it was time to ship foreign born Jews to round them up and ship them to Germany, to Auschwitz. And somebody in the class broke out of their role and said, how could they do that? And I remember, I thought, okay, well, we're just gonna stop and talk about this a little bit. And so we talked about it, but it turned into a really good discussion about evil when people do evil, why do they do it? How do we understand it? And the fact that we're all capable of it, right? These things didn't happen, they weren't done by crazy people. They were done by people who fully believed what they did. Um, and so I thought, okay, just to have that discussion, it was worth it because I, th I think that got the students to pay attention to other things. And it showed up then when I always have them write a debrief essay when the game is over. And it really showed up in the essays. I thought, okay, they learned a lot of stuff. That was fun. But we also, I also learned that it, there were things that I just needed to change. And this always happens. You, start, you put a game together, you're not gonna know until you run it. And so the students are a great help. Um, this game is still, it's gonna undergo changes because of some of the people in this room uh, who started on Thursday. Um, so spring of 2021, we were back in person. Uh, if you were here, you remember social distancing and the little green dots on the, uh, the stickers on the desks and so forth. Um, but we were in person, I made tweaks. My civ classes were meeting in Heiner Hall. Uh, Elijah Eckert is here, he remembers that. And in fact, he's one of the people who made a great suggestion. There were a number of them that spring. I think pretty sure it was Elijah who said, um, if I have the power to arrest people, why do I have to wait till the end of class? Can't I do that during class? And so I thought about it for probably at least 15 seconds and said, okay. Um, but I said, but you have to have limits. You can only arrest a certain number. You can't just arrest the whole class. Um, that would make the game end. Um, but a number of other things came up. So they made good suggestions. They said, okay, this game can, can go somewhere. All right. But what happened since the spring of 2021? Um, well, in June of that year, um, it turned out the, uh, the people, I get a little background here, when you want to do a reacting game, you actually register it with the organization um, so that nobody else grabs that idea and starts working on it. So I had done that with, you know, my, I registered it on behalf of my students and myself, and we said, okay, we're gonna do this game, put it on your list. Um, and so I got a somewhat uh, embarrassed email from the guy who had told that to in, in September of 2020. And uh, he said, um, I kind of uh, didn't, 
keep track of that as well as I should. And so somebody's contacted me, and they started a game also in France during World War II. And I wondered if you guys could work it out. I'm like, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, but it turned out uh, the author of that game, a professor named Darlene Rivas from Pepperdine University, uh, emailed me and said, hey, you know, I'm working on this game, and her game wasn't as far along, and it had a different focus. It's, on, it's called Resistance and Rescue in, in uh, Vichy, France. And it's, um, it's really about people whose primary focus is trying to figure out how to smuggle refugees out of France to safety. Um, and all the things that hide them and all those kinds of things. And I didn't, I had a little bit of that in my game, but I, it kind of got neglected in terms of other things. Um, and so I said, well, okay, we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, you know, we'll send me your, so we exchanged files. Um, later that summer, we had a Zoom call and started talking about possibilities. And I said, well, listen, I'm going to be on sabbatical in the spring of 2022. Um, so I'm, I'm going to work on this game some more, so send that stuff to me and I'll, you know, I'll do some work on it. Um, so I did, but my sabbatical for the spring of 2022 was, I, was, I proposed and I did, I worked on both the Reformation game that I mentioned earlier and this one. So I kind of split my time up. I made good progress on both. I didn't make very much progress on figuring out how to merge her game, um, but we, uh, we, uh, we, we kept in touch, um, and she was kind of working on our, she, she took a little bit of my game and worked it into one of her classes with her game, uh, so we did some things. Uh, and then we um, moved forward to spring 2023 when I could test the game again, now two years later from, from spring of 2021, on um, my Civ students, again, poor guinea pigs, uh, some of them are here. Um, and uh, uh, I got more good input, and we made some tweaks. I'll just tell you about one of them because I told my students about this. Uh, and this is just an example of student creativity and how it can improve your work um, when you're doing one of these. Um, so one of the things that the people who joined the French government that you know, acted and, and worked with the Germans, one of the characters actually acquired the power during, and I think it was in like 42 or 43, to just issue edicts. And they were law. It wasn't, you know, a democratic government. And, and so the person who had this role said, um, so I can issue edicts, right? And I said, yeah. Uh, and she said, can I, um, like, issue edicts about what's going on in the classroom? And I thought about it for probably 20 seconds and, and said, uh, sure, tell me what you have in mind. And she said, well, you know, if, if people are doing things that I don't like, I'm just going to tell them to stop. And then she said, also, people are using their cell phones to communicate their plots and so forth because they don't want to be seen talking to people because they might be arrested. Um, so I want to confiscate all the cell phones. Yeah. This was a year ago. Do you know how people that are 18, 19, 20 feel about their cell phones and putting them on a table in the front of the room where they can't touch them or use them. I had normally shy, quiet people who said, no, I'm not going to do that. And I said, yes, you are. <laughs> um, but it turned into a teaching moment because I said, listen, they, they opened people's mail. They tapped telephones. They controlled means of communication when they wanted to. And that's what she's doing. So it's perfectly legitimate. Like, how are we going to do this? I said, you're going to have to figure it out. Because that's what people had to do. If you're really going to try to resist the government, you've got to be creative um, and work at it. Um, so um, it was an interesting moment. Um, but at any rate, it happened. So I got a lot of good feedback. Um, <clears throat> and then um, a couple of other things happened. I had another Zoom call uh, with my uh, would-be co-author uh, in August, right before she went. To, she's spending this academic year in Switzerland on a study abroad program that Pepperdine has. Uh, which is tough luck for her. Um, but I said, listen, I've got this upper level class. I had eight students. Uh, it's the modern Europe class. Um, and so I have some other things I want to do, but we're going to spend part of the middle of the semester uh, just as a, a group workshopping, trying to figure out how to put the, if we can merge these two games. Um, and so we did that. We spent, I don't know, about four weeks, I think. Um, on that, we came up with some ideas. Some of them I've 
kind of worked into the play test that's coming uh, here um, with my uh, three civ classes. <clears throat> and um, so my, my three HS116 classes have done all the setup. Well, Reagan missed it, but <clears throat> <laughs> your, your, your attendance is pretty good, usually. Okay, he went home early for the uh, Easter break, but that's okay. He was a ways from campus, but then he just slept in this morning. Um, so, um, you would think if you intentionally missed on Thursday, you'd show up on the next Tuesday, right? Yeah, that's what I would think, too. But anyway, in fact, that's what I do think. Um, so, they're all set up. So, they're starting the game on Thursday, and they know this, but one of the things that happens in reacting games, typically a reacting game comes with factions, like groups that agree on certain objectives and they work together. The thing with this game, there are sort of two things that are important. One is, in 1940, there weren't any clear factions. Yes, there were people who were willing to side with, um, you know, collaborating with the Germans, and there were people who were willing to side with Charles de Gaulle and say, no, we're going to hold out. But then there were a lot of people in the middle. Um, but it, it wasn't really clear um, if all those, pe those people who had those ideas, at, well, what, what is clear is that they often didn't know what other people were doing and they weren't very good at cooperating. And the other thing that's important, uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, but um, because we're using in the game all characters, real people, um, if I distribute, usually I give out a list to the students, say, okay, here's the list of characters, here's who's playing who. I can't do that in this game because they'll just go look them up and they'll find out who the spies are. So I have to give fake names to everybody. So only the student, when they get their role sheet, knows who their character's real name is, although today in the character intros, at least one person used their real name. I thought, hmm, I wonder if everybody got picked that up besides me. Um, and maybe they did it on purpose, I don't know. Um, but um, and so they're in a very uncomfortable situation. Now, I tell students at the beginning of the fall semester or the first time they're doing games, I say, okay, so we're going to play. Uh, I don't have tests. Uh, I don't have a traditional textbook, but you're going to develop trust issues. Um, and I also tell them knowledge is power. Um, and so... This game is the ultimate trust issue game because they go into it not knowing who their friends are, who are the people they're going to be able to work with. They have to figure it out. So there's a lot of uncertainty, um, and that's why some of them are here. They're trying to get clues, uh, but they're not going to get any. Um, and so, but I like that, and I told them today, um, because that was the situation in late June of 1940. People were in shock. They weren't sure what to do. There were between six and eight million people on the, on the roads of Paris in June of 1940, fleeing from the Germans, some of them from Belgium, but at least six million from northern and western France, including Paris. Paris emptied out, uh, almost emptied out, almost overnight. A lot of shops closed. People just took off. The trains were jammed. If you had access to a car or a truck, that was jammed. You took everything you could with you. A lot of people were walking or they had horse-drawn carts or whatever, and they were heading south to get away from the Germans. So it was a crazy time. And so uncertainty is part of the situation. That's just the way it is. Um, so that's where the game is right now. It's not done. Um, one of the things I did uh, last weekend uh, was to uh, create some more... Uh, new roles of characters I had found in my reading. I'm like, ooh, ooh, this one would be good. So I took out some I didn't like that much, put in some new ones. I don't know how those are going to work because I haven't used them before, but that's, that's part of the process. And I've got a list of more. I just haven't had time to, to do them. But I, I wrote three or four this last weekend. Um, and then, and I mentioned this before, but I want to sort of come back to this, the new books and the articles just keep coming. So my students and I that started this game in the fall of 2019, just for fun, yesterday I did a little, I went into the, to the um, card catalog library and just books that, that Richland has access to, you know, and we don't have access to all the books in the world, but books that students can access just through our library, just books, 
Since 2019, there are six new books, plus academic articles, and so those are the books in English. There's lots of other stuff. Uh, and then there's just, there's certain things that I keep finding, I'm thinking, oh man, that's another angle I should probably work into the game. Um, and so, I'm developing this list of things I still need to do to add to the game to make it more realistic. And one of them is, one thing I don't have, but I really need, and I just really ran into this in the last few days, um, is how did, how did French farmers react to this whole situation? What did they do? And there's a growing body of research to show that a lot of them were quite comfortable with sort of the far right political parties, the people that flirted with, flirted with or were fascists in France, um, and they were pretty comfortable, a lot of them, with anti-Semitism and authoritarian government and so forth. So how do I bring that into the game, especially because the economy is, is a huge issue, and I haven't done a very good job yet of bringing that in. Um, for example, one of the things I learned um, in one of the books that I didn't, wasn't able to read in the fall of 2019 and read since, a um, book I didn't even know about until after the fall of 2019, um, spends a, a good chunk talking about the edicts that the government put out to control the French population during the war uh, after, the, after the surrender. Uh, and one of them was uh, to ration food, they had a recommended diet plan. This is how many ounces of meat and uh, ounces of butter and vegetable, all these kinds of things. And the, the, the government policy was that no adult should have more than 1,300 calories a day. Simultaneously, the government was also, and this was kind of a French nativism, nationalism thing, um, incentivizing French women to have babies to boost the population. How'd you like to be a pregnant woman on 1,300 calories a day? So what happens? Black markets, lots of, of smuggling and all that kind of thing, and I haven't really brought that into the game, so I think if I can get the farmers and some other things, I'll do that. Um, which means that the question that I get more and more these days, what are you going to do when you retire? Well, this is one of them, is to continue to work on this game, I'm really having a blast. I did not expect in the fall of 2019 that I would end up in a whole new research area, getting to write and read and, um, you know, I keep seeing things, I'm like, ooh, put that on the list, I have a stack in my office of stuff that I bought, or do you remember when Barnes and Noble closed at Jefferson Point and moved um, across the way? Well, they had, a, you know, like a clearance sale stuff they didn't want to move. I went up there and I found a couple books. Well, new books, this was after the prototype. Um, one of those books turned into a role in the game. Um, another one sitting there, I haven't gotten to it yet. It's about fashion and war and Vichy France. Um, Another book I haven't gotten to, uh, this is just for Dr. Webb. There's a book on Vichy France and the environmental impact on France. So environmental historians are getting interested. So there's, that book was published um, 15 years ago, just. So, you know, and there, I'm sure there's more since then. So the fascinating thing to me is that here I am an old professor. I mean, the fall of 2019, I won't tell you my exact age, but I was old. Right? I tell my students I'm old. Um, and, you know, it was, I mean, here I am, not quite five years later, and I'm getting ready to retire. And I did not know that I was going to be getting drawn into a whole new area of, of reading and thinking and exploring. And I'm just having a blast with it. Um, which means Natalie and I are going to have to negotiate on how many books I do get to bring home from my office. Um, she has a different idea than I do on that, so, um, but we'll figure that out. Um, so, it was unanticipated, great fun, really welcome. We talk a lot about being lifelong learners around here. Um, it's nice to, to do that and to be part of it. Um, so, colleagues, you're not done yet. Um, you, you, don't, you don't know what will happen that you'll get excited about and you'll be like, dang it, Brodigan warned us about that. Um, and students, you have so much time ahead of you. Um, 
who knows what you're gonna run into. Whatever you're, whatever you're doing, whatever field you're working in or you're just interested in, things are gonna pop up that you didn't imagine could pop up and you'll get interested in them. I mean, five years ago, we didn't know COVID was gonna come along, right? Um, that's created all kinds of interesting things. Um, some of them not fun, but nonetheless interesting. Uh, but, but this is what happened to me. So that's my story. I'll take questions. <clears throat> Did I take too much time? Not enough? Well, that's not bad. Who's first? Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Um, the the interest in World War II, I think, continues to expand. It's remarkable, and this is true in France, by the way. Uh, I didn't even mention the uh, the fact that some some of these people who were part of the Vichy government came out of the war and kind of seamlessly got themselves into the post-war government and kind of were quiet about their, what they did during the war. And then not really until the 1990s, because of the work of historians and people digging through the archives, some of these people were found out and the government started putting them on trial. In fact, one of them, uh, enough, one person was infuriated enough that bef just before his trial started, somebody found him in the streets of Paris and shot him and killed him. He was an old man. They killed him for what he had done 50 years before. Um, remarkable stuff. So, yeah. <clears throat> Reagan. <laughs> um, yeah, you're going to have to ask your classmates what we did in class today. Ignore him. <laughs> Who's next? Oh, the setup? Um, so, well, first of all, we talk about the historical background some. I give everybody their role sheets. Um, students know this. Um, one of the things that, when I very first went to reacting conferences, if people were like, and, you know, this, this is published in the game. First, you do historical background, you do this and that. Then on day two or three of setup, you give students their role sheets. That does not work. Um, and the reacting faculty are divided about this. Students want their role sheets first. They want to know who they're going to play, which means they're excited and interested. So I give them their role sheets, give them some time to look at those. I warn them in this case about their characters that they, they had to guard the role sheets with their lives because if somebody else finds out who they're playing, they'll find out their secrets and then that'll be it for them, probably. Um, and um, they, my students also have, this is a reminder for people like Reagan, a reading quiz on the historical background, which is due at 2 o'clock tomorrow on Moodle. For those of you that needed a reminder. Um, um, but um, then this game also comes with students have what are called personal influence points, which is a, uh, a mechanism that a lot of game designers use. And for this game, at the, at the last part of each session, I have a worksheet for them to choose how they want to use the ones they have, whether they want to support the government, oppose it, whether they want to take specific actions, which can include having someone arrested, it can include attempting to assassinate someone. So we actually, um, last Thursday, did a dry run through that so students could understand how to use that and how to work it and so forth. Um, the people who missed that are just going to be lost on this Thursday when they have to do it. Um, and there are a few. It wasn't just you, Reagan. So, uh, But anyway, so that kind of thing. And then today, we just really talked about the first session. And, oh, and all the students had to introduce their character to the rest of the class, which was really fun today. I, somebody emailed me yesterday and said, so when we're doing character introductions, can we lie? And I said to my students today, what do you think I told them? And they said, oh, you said yes. And I said, yeah, by all means, <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Um, because 
I tell students with these games, um, not only trust issues, but deception, backstabbing, double crossing are all part of the situation. Um, and I say that partly because this is a life skill to learn how to figure out who you can really trust and who you can't. Because you do have to trust people. You do have to work with some people, but there's other people you're not going to. I also have to warn them to keep this from spilling over outside of class. That warning usually works. Not always. I've heard stories. But anyway, uh, yeah, good question. So is there a, another historical time period or events where if you were looking at your next game, you would want to go after it? Yeah, I want to do the trial and execution of Charles I, the King of England, in 1648 and 49. Um, there's a guy who's had that game. The reacting organization has this, what they call the big list of reacting games, the Blorg. Um, there are north of 500 games somewhere in the development pipeline. Uh, about, oh, I didn't count up recently, there's probably 30 to 40 that have actually made it to publication. Um, and then there are others, and there's five levels. So there, somebody had that game at level one, like it's just an idea. And it's been there since 2014. 2015. I'm like, I don't think this person's going to do this, and I would love to fool around with that because I think I know that stuff. English Civil War era, revolution, there's a bunch of stuff you could do, so I wouldn't mind taking a crack at that. I also, I used to teach public policy, and at one time I had the idea, I actually kind of ran a prototype of this, um, uh, a, a policy game on self-driving vehicles. Now I think I would do AI. If I was going to get back into that, incorporated into self-driving vehicles, it could be a lot of fun. But anyway, yeah, always have ideas. For those of you who are worried about my retirement, I won't be bored. So, yeah, Tom. Oh, well, let's just talk about the French Revolution game. <laughs> oh. The French Revolution game is a game that reacting faculty refer to as a hot game. Because it's a revolution and everything's at stake. If you don't win, you might die, right? Um, <clears throat> so the French Revolution game comes down to, in the end, um, real quick historical background. In, in the summer of 1792, the Austrians and the Prussians declared war on France and set out to bring an army in to overthrow the revolution and restore the king to full power. Um, and the revolutionaries were distracted by other things, and, but eventually fighting does happen in August of 1792, and the final battle of, the, of that, that war takes place just outside of Paris, and it literally could have gone either way. And so there is a die roll that's influenced by things that students do during the game, but in some classes it comes down to 50-50. And when, when you do that die roll, at least half the class is in a circle around where I'm rolling the, or one of them is rolling the dice. I don't, I don't, I try to avoid doing the die rolls because I don't want to be blamed for the outcome. Um, but everything's hanging on it because either they win or they lose. And again, if they win, they get a few bonus points. But I, I don't think they even care about the bonus points. I had one in, in February, um, early February when we were finishing the game, one of the classes all the attackers needed to do was roll a three, four, five, or six, and they rolled a two and lost. And the disappointment, I mean, people were coming in to the next, oh, I heard about that. You know, they were telling everybody. So, um, yeah, did that answer the question? Yeah, it's, it can be pretty intense. I mean, I have people who are still holding grudges from the first game we did last fall. You know who you are or last year, um, <laughs> so yeah, Victoria. Do you have a method in how you assign the roles to the students? <laughs> I do. Um, um, the hardest uh, roles to assign, the hardest game to do roles for is the very first game when you don't know students very well. Although I do some interactive activities so I can kind of figure out who the sort of natural leaders are and who the people are who want to lay, stay in the background. Um, but then I try to fit, I try to do a fit characteristic personality fit, but then I also, one of my goals for, for my classes, because I, especially in civ classes, because I have 30 students or so, 
is I want them to work with different students through the semester so they get to know a lot of different people. Uh, and it's one of the things that students come to appreciate, um, even if they don't like some of the people they have to work with. But again, it's a life skill, right? So, um, so I, I keep that in mind. I try to keep a gender balance as much as possible among factions and so forth. Um, but some people, I mean, I look at it and I think, I have to give this role to this person because it just, it's them. Um, and, you know, but also the other thing that I do, and there may be people in here, um, sometimes I have people that I, I can tell would, are staying, you know, they're staying in their shell and they're not going to come out of it unless I give them a role that really pushes them and challenges them. Right, Paige? <laughs> um, but it's good for them. And then they say, well, I can't do that. And I say, oh, I think you can. And which one of us has more experience with college students? And then I always win the argument at that point. Um, but I, I want people to, this is part of my teaching philosophy anyway, students don't know what they're capable of unless someone challenges them and asks them to do more than they think they can do. And they can. And it's one of the most rewarding things about being a professor is seeing students blossom. I love it. Um, I've got people right now that were quiet as a mouse in September and they're not anymore. Um, and that's a win. Um, you know, or people will say to me, well, so-and-so is not quiet except in this class. I'm like, okay, thanks for telling me. We're gonna see if we can see, I wanna see the whole person. Um, so um, that's, that's one of my goals too. So I have, I have multiple things going on. Sometimes if I know people are really good friends, one time I'll, I'll put them in the same faction so they get to work together, but then I split them up the next time, so. So I'll hand over here, you still have yours? Oh, uh oh, what's Hope gonna ask me? <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if you have any advice for staying motivated uh, when you're doing personal projects, especially, it seems like a lot of the stuff you do is writing heavy, uh, so how do you stay energized? Um, well, I'm a nerd. Um, College professors here may not want me to tell you this, but I've told students this before. College professors are all nerds. I saw a study a few years ago that on average, college professors finished in the top 1.4% of their undergraduate class. What does that tell you? Nerds, right? They didn't spend time doing sports and theater and all this other stuff. They were in the library or in the lab or someplace else most of the time. College professors are not normal people, right? So, um, so I geek out about some of this stuff. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, the challenge is going to be in retirement, I'll think, well, do I really have to do that? But I think the want to is strong enough, and my wife will say, yeah, you need to go do that because <laughs> you're driving me crazy. Um, so, um, and, and it, it's part of, being balanced. I'm actually, this is a public service announcement. I'm speaking in chapel on Friday. This is a busy week. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, what, what I don't know and how I'm not worried about what I don't know about retirement and motivation and all that stuff. So, yeah, but I, I keep lists of things that like, I need to fix this. Like, well, I, I, I wanna get this game, Darlene and I, my co collaborator, wanna get this game to the point where other people can use it and test it and so forth. And there's a bunch of things you have to have in place. One of those is an instructor's manual. I have pieces of it, but it's not, it's not together at all. So I just have a folder that says instructor's manual and there's no document in there. That's, that's the actual manual. It's just different things that are gonna go into it. And there's a lot of other things I have to create. So um, anyway, um, but I want other people to be able to do what I'm doing with it in other universities and colleges, which means I have a lot of work to do yet. So uh, since I'm not going to be able to be using it, somebody else will you know, have to live through them. All right. That was the last question, right? All right. Let's thank Dr. Brody. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. For the students who need extra credit that I promised you this today,
the sign-up sheets are in here, um, and that's the code for chapel attendance, I think. He needs.